Art Fine, coming to you from uh, Hollywood on a beautiful day with some real groovy guests on uh, Art Fine's Poker Party. Uh, book ending with me, the two fine guests, is a regular guy, uh, Todd Everett. Todd, welcome to the show. Just feeling like a regular guy today, but we've got some extraordinary guests. I know. Uh, and let's, let's not palaver with you at all and go right over to Barry Goldberg. Barry, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, man. Let me yeah, shake your paw. Right. Good to see you. You brought a cigar. That was a very good yeah. thought. Uh, they've banned us from having cigars here for That's some That's quite time. a cigar. <laughs> some, something about uh, having a, a flower show right after us or something, and people, people got offended. But, but we'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk during the show as if it's a poker party, as if we have cigars. Uh, so Barry Goldberg's uh, a ma much renowned musician and stuff, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But then we'll go over to Carla right now. We've got Carla Olson. Carla, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you've been on my list for a long time. I, I could show you two or three years worth of my notebooks where it says people what I want to. Oh yeah, people I want to call to have on the show. And there's Carla. And I, uh, I just realized, of course, that I always had your name misspelled. But maybe that's why I've been. Yeah, he kept, around he kept calling up uh, K A R L A Olson, oh, and she kept yeah. saying "buzz off, buddy," and he could never understand it. He wondered what you, why you were being mad at him and whatever. Well, I wasn't on his Christmas list. Well, no, Carla. Yeah. Oops. Carla Olson mm -hmm. is a musician of much renown, uh, stemming back to such things as this a and album from what, 85, 4, 6? No, this one is, uh, you've got the... Amigo! <laughs> I'm out of order, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's out of order. You're out of order. Okay. This is the Swedish solo album that I, I uh, released about a year ago. Okay. It's a great picture. Yeah, it's real nice. Thank you. Uh, next to that... You tell me so I don't stumble. This is the English release of uh, the album I did with Gene Clark called So Rebellious a Lover, which is uh, actually out on Rhino here in Gene the States. Gene Clark, uh, formerly of the birds. Indeed. Yeah, the guy they're pretending wasn't, wasn't a bird. Now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and also I want to get into that if we can. <laughs> yeah, we're, also, we have, kind of a little hard to read, but it's Tech Stones, the band you started. Oh, right, right. Was that back in... 70, 78 actually was. Uh, I started it with Kathy Valentine. We moved out here from Texas together, and she was one of the original guitar players of the band. And then she left the band and joined the Go Go's, and then became my band after that. That was that was uh, from Austin, where you sprung right. from, right? Right. Uh, so you were there right when all the whole Austin thing was really going on. I mean, it still is, but I mean, you were there in '76 and '5 and '7 when it's, it looked like the next Nashville, the next. Something. Yeah, well, that was sort of the second time around. The first really? time around was with Willie Nelson and Whalen. And, you but know, that, that was the same group. period, right? Yeah, Seven, I was, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I wasn't playing uh, in a band at that time that was uh, playing original material. I was playing in an all 60s cover band, which was a lot of fun. No kidding. Yeah. But I uh, made but a lot more money then than I'm making now. But uh, were you? In, uh, was it a 60s girl band? No, no, I was the only girl. So you were singing in, in your Actually, cover? I was just a guitar player in the band. Yeah, there was a a guy singer who was like a Mick Jagger kind of guy. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah, we did about 18 Stone songs, I guess, in <laughs> four 45-minute sets, so <laughs> we covered a lot of territory. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, but, uh, yeah the, the, uh, the whole uh, Austin scene came about about 77, 78, where, when the Sex Pistols took off in, in uh, England, and then it sort of graduated to Texas, and all of a sudden there was this really uh, major punk rock kind of scene there. Which Gee, is that's not even what I think. Todd, is that what you think of when you think of Austin, the, the great <coughs> punk rock Austin explosion of 77, 8, 9? Well, they kept that pretty much to themselves, I think. Uh, I don't know that, because I don't know that. When I think of Austin, I <laughs> think of Did Michael Wayland. Murphy start that one, too? Uh, unfortunately, no, no. <laughs> Michael, Michael was, didn't, didn't get in on that. He was busy. That's Michael he, Martin. He Murphy. was actually busy up in Colorado trying to be cool. And, yeah. you know, Boy, this is really inside way. stuff. Barry, are you following this? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about Barry for a minute. Barry comes from a, a less hip place. That's uh, Chicago. I, I say that because I'm from Chicago. Uh, oh, you know, this is funny. Th they missed... They, Meant to put your name in, and I think in a uh, a thing I, I I worked on in '87. I worked on a TV show called Tour of Duty, uh, Vietnam era show. And uh, the first I remember watching the the pilot, and it said um, there's a guy who's got a harmonica and he sits around and plays the blues, and he says, "Yeah, man, I'm from Chicago. I was friends with Al Cooper there." Oh, I said, huh? 
because they didn't consult me on the script. I was just. Yeah, I was from New York. Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> I know. As, as far as Be sure tell Al that, would yeah. you? <laughs> Art was one guess, of the first casualties of the Vietnam War in, in Tour of Duty. <laughs> was the first casualties of Tour of Duty. So I think maybe they meant to put your name in because you were a Chicago blues guy from the 60s, uh, along with Mike Bloomfield. Was there, I know Bloomfield was in Butterfield's band in Chicago. Right. And so was, what's his name, the guy? Elvin Bishop. Elvin Bishop. Elvin Bishop. Yeah. And, uh, Mark Naftal and Sam Lay. Mark Naftal was, was the keyboard player. <laughs> so were you uh, <laughs> trucking with those guys? Or? Oh, yeah. We used to, uh, before the Butterfield band, we used to play with, go down to the south side or west side, play with Muddy Waters and Howling Wolf. We were 17, just still in high school. Uh -huh. And I'd go down with Mike and uh, Michael, and uh, mm -hmm. we'd, we'd just play with Howlin' Wolf and just have a great time. Wow. How did those guys react to 17-year-old Jewish guys coming up well, and very, playing with them? It was a brave, we had to really have a lot of courage in order yeah. to do something like that. Because first of all, just to go down to the west yeah. side and the south side was, it was a feat in itself. And let alone going up on the stage and, and, and really, you know, 100% blues club, mm -hmm. uh, you really had to, to have your chops together and really know what you're doing. Otherwise, God knows what could happen to you, you know. Well, you, well, guys, you guys at least looked uh, kind of the part. Steve Miller looked like somebody's, uh, you know. Well, Miller, Steve little, came a little later. Yeah. When Steve it was little he little made his first record when, with, uh, with Barry, though. Steve Miller. Wait, Steve's from... He's from we, Wisconsin. Uh, Steve, he? Steve was playing. Yeah, he was playing at the University of Wisconsin. Yeah, he would come to Chicago on the weekends, and we formed a blues band called the Goldberg Miller Blues Band. Uh -huh. We followed Paul Butterfield into Big John's when Paul went to New York to the Village, uh -huh. and we were the, uh, the second band to come into Big John's. And uh, so, was that your first uh, formal band? Uh? The the go. I I played with Paul for a while. You did. And what uh, did you play? Uh, keyboards. Mm -hmm. And when Paul went to Newport for the Newport Folk Festival, he invited me to come with him. And uh, I arrived there with Michael, and Paul's producer at the time decided that there shouldn't be an electric organ or, or anything like that with the Butterfield Band. He wanted to keep it pure. So there I was with, uh, with, without a gig, huh. a long way from home. And did, and did Mike end up go, Mike working? Mike wound up introducing me to Bob Dylan, uh -huh. and I got to play, that's how I met Bob and, and got to play in his band. So. So was what it, period uh, were you playing? In uh, 1965. Box? That was. So which f albums are you on? Uh, I'm only on a, an obscure uh, underground album with Bob, uh, as far as recording with him. But there was an, a live version of Newport mm -hmm. that was recorded that I'm playing on with him. So you're part of the touring band, or once in a while touring? Well, with just him? once in a while. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, there's a chance that that Newport stuff may be coming out. Vanguard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no, what's happening is that a friend of ours has been going through Vanguard tapes, pulling stuff for Vanguard, mm -hmm. and she found the Bob Dylan stuff there, but it will probably wind up on a, another Columbia box set or something like that. I mean, he has to approve it in mm -hmm. CBS because he was on the label then and mm -hmm. all of that sort of thing, so it may wind up on CBS, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. it has been located apparently. It's just swell. Well, sp speaking of Dylan, we're, we're very anti-chronological on this show. We're jumping all over the place, but let's, let's take us now. Okay, you follow me. I want to hear uh, we, it's let's take us to 1984. <laughs> is it 84 or 83? 87. Oh, what is it with the, it, this, this, this video? With the video, it was, uh, was 83. <laughs> this, this Bob Dylan video that you're on. Right. Uh, let's, let's run this. This is called Sweethearts Like You. What's the album? Do you remember? Infidels. Infidels. It was the first single. So this is a scene from it with Dylan singing, and then you are finger syncing. Pantomiming. So h how did you get onto a Bob Dylan video as a guitarist? Uh, well, I was invited to be a member of the band uh, through uh, someone that worked for him that was uh, in charge of assembling the band. Uh -huh. And he was a fan of the Textones and oh. said, you know, Bob wants a really universal looking band. Uh -huh. And it was a Rastafarian bass player and uh, one of the guys from TSOL was on keyboards. Uh, Charlie Quintana from the Havilines was on drums. Oh. And I was playing guitar. Wow. Yeah. Can we, uh, Mr. Mr. Director, can we take a look? Well, very good. Very good finger syncing. I don't really yeah, see anything. Thank you. Thank you. I, I haven't thank seen anything quite that fabulous <laughs> before. So there's, there's, because of this video, that a, a relationship developed with Mick Taylor? Uh, that's correct. I went down to see Mick Taylor play with uh, John Mayall at the Golden Bear, mm -hmm. the original Golden Bear.
down here yeah. uh, a number of years later and uh, introduced myself and said, you know, I pantomimed your guitar solo in the, the video, and, you know, he's such a nice guy, you know, he just, you know, such a personable guy that we sort of developed a relationship long distance. He lives in New York. Mm -hmm. I was living here, and we kept meaning to get together and do something, either ride or he wanted to maybe come out and play some dates with the Techstones because he wasn't really playing in a band at the time. Mm -hmm. He's had different, this band, that band, but nothing's really been real permanent. Mm -hmm. So we finally did actually get together to do that in uh, March of this this past 1990. year. 1990. Yeah. And, and you uh, guys played at the Roxy. Huh? Right, played at the Roxy. Barry played on keyboards. Really? Uh, you know, Ian McClagan and Juke Logan played harmonica and my band, the rest of the, you know, the band, Techstones. So and that record is coming out? That is coming out in January on, on uh, Chameleon mm -hmm. yeah, in the States. Is it coming out sooner overseas? I'm not supposed to say that. Oh, it's, okay. Yeah. It's no, that, it isn't. It, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't bother looking in the import sections of any records. Well, it'll be under, we uh, don't under take away all those sales yeah, from Comedia. Exactly. exactly. Uh, it's under, it'll be listed under your names first. It's Carl Olson and Mick it'll, Taylor. It's uh, Carl Olson and Mick Taylor. The Roxy. It should be. I unless they change the title of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so. That sounds. That sounds real neat. Yeah, it was fun. A lot of fun. Well, it's got to play some blues for a change. But is there a nice chance years. of this becoming a pairing you will uh, repeat? Well, we've tried to sort of get together. Mick's out on the road. He's been on the road since May uh, for a, a live album that he recorded in Sweden a couple of years back that's, um, that he's been touring for. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, once he gets doing that, gets through doing that, maybe we'll get together and do some shows, maybe you know, write some stuff, and hopefully maybe cut an album together if we can. Cool. It'd be really great. He's a great guitar player. Great. Neat. Yeah. One of the things that Mr. Goldberg did that I am particularly fond of, I think he's probably best known, I guess, as a session keyboard player, producer, and that sort of thing. But you and is it Jerry Goffin? Jerry Goffin. Wrote a song called It's Not the Spotlight, which I know basically, I think, is Bobby Bland version. Right. And who else has cut that? Oh, Rod Stewart's cut it, the Neville Brothers. Oh, them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just oh, I know the Bobby Bland version. I love the Bobby Bland version. <laughs> It's a, it's a great version. I mean, how, how did you get together with Jerry Goff and who is best known as a songwriter? And is well, there any particular story behind this song? Yeah, uh, a friend of mine, Bennett Glatzer from New York, introduced me to, uh, he was, used to be partners with Albert Grossman who yeah. managed uh, The Electric Flag, which is a band I was in. Sure. Um, introduced me to Jerry in New York City in 1973. And uh, I was always an admirer of his and I considered like an honor just, just that he would consider writing with me. Yeah. And uh, we uh, took us like three or four weeks of solid writing every single day to finally break in and, and write our first song. And that was actually our first song that we wrote together. How uh, did, how did, who did the first version? Uh, the first version of that was done by Rod Stewart. Really? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And were you in the, on the first Electric Flag album? Yeah. How did they, who, who is who's the, anyway, how did the electric flag come to convince people that they wrote Drinking Wine Spodiote? How did we convince them? It was, yeah. uh, it's, I think the original uh, was Sticks McGee or yeah. something. And, uh, but your version is called Wine. Wine, Sp and, wine and, O Spodiote. Or or just, it's, no, it's just called I Wine and it says PD arranged by. Arranged by Mike, Michael Bloomfield, right. Traditional. Not even Bloomfield, who's the other guy? Nick Gravenitis. Nick Gravenitis. Nick Gravenitis. I think that, that was one. one of Nick's favorite songs and he just. Favorite enough he it claims he wrote it. Like you adopt, <laughs> like you adopt the son, he adopted that, <laughs> you know, it's like. Just sort of like he sang it so good that he deserved to. Right. so much that he said they wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 that's water under or over the bridge, Todd. That's old stuff. That's something I've always <laughs> wanted to ask. I mean, I, 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 I really wish don't know it was Gravenitis. I'd love to ask him <laughs> <laughs> in front of all of these listeners. So actually, the electric, uh, Mary, the electric flag was the uh, biggest aggregation you were with, the biggest selling uh, band that you were a uh, uh, you know, main part of, right, Electric Flag? Yes, that was actually my f the first band that, for a while, was was uh, commercially successful. Mm -hmm. That first album is out. CBS has re-released the Electric Flag, the first and best album, as a CD with a couple of extra cuts on it and that sort of thing. It's highly recommended. It's just a wonderful record, no matter who wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great version of Drinking Wine Spodiote too. 
So what else? Did, of course, I remember there was something called Two Jews Blues. Uh, what was that? That was uh, a blues album that I wanted to record with Michael Bloomfield. Uh -huh. And uh, we couldn't really get the rights to use his name on it. Uh -huh. So uh, he was with CBS and I was with Buddha. And for some reason, CBS wouldn't give uh, their permission. For some reason. For some reason. Yeah, so when does CBS give permission to do anything? Exactly. Yeah. So it was just uh, Barry Goldberg and. You oh, know? really? Yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, it probably cost me a lot of sales on that one. You know, just. Because a lot I of people thought it was Al Cooper. <laughs> 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 well, actually, uh, we haven't been up to date on what you're doing right now. Uh, we haven't discussed that. Uh, I'm doing a lot of film work. I'm underscoring movies and writing title songs for movies and uh, I actually got to produce Bob Dylan in a movie a few months ago called Flashback with Dennis Hopper. Uh -huh. We did a, uh, a version of People Get Ready um, and um, also yeah. been working Which wound up on one of his albums. Too. Pardon me? It wound up on one of his albums, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I've got also uh, work with Ivan Neville for another movie that's coming out called Captain America. And he did the main title song. I, I got to produce that one. And uh, recently I'm working on a new Zalman King movie mm -hmm. called Blue Movie Blue. And, uh, you have TV, show, TV credits too, don't you? Yeah, I've been doing uh, TV shows. I did a couple episodes of Murphy Brown. Um, I so didn't know. I mean, episodes of Murphy Brown are individually scored by different people? I started, I, started, I did the pilot and the first episode. Uh -huh. And um, then I got an offer to do a feature and went on to, to do the feature. I see. So this is a rel is how long have you been doing this? This is a pretty good day. About four years. How'd you get into it? Um, basically, <laughs> basically. This is another good story. I've always, uh, I've always so. wanted, I've, I've always, I love movies. I love, I love television, I love to watch television. And I've been, for years, I've been experimenting, putting music to this and the action scenes. Well, you've and been sitting at home scoring TV absolutely, shows? Absolutely, yeah, I just see. for fun, you know. Okay. And, and, uh, <laughs> When things got a little slow on, on the rock and roll <laughs> side of things, yeah. I uh, attempted to get started and, and meet people, agents, and to get me into this business. Wow. And thank God it's been, uh, it's been pretty good to me so far. So what was your first credit? Uh, the first credit I did was a, uh, a movie called Thrashin', which was a uh, Thrashin', thrashin movie? skateboard movie. <laughs> and I got my feet wet. and. You know, now in this age of colorization, I've wanted to go and back back score some movies. Uh, let's see, The Wild One, perhaps? Yeah. Funny you wow. should mention that. This has been a continuing theme. Todd's heard it once. <laughs> uh, but don't don't be shy about bringing it up. Uh, the, uh, the Wild One, I always thought, this kind of West Coast jazz that runs throughout the Marlon Brando movie, I always thought it should be like Hank Ballard and the Midnighters and Work With Me Annie and stuff Work like that. Work With Me Annie, great. Because it was more delinquent type music. It was oh, more absolutely. rebellious. Uh, speaking of great music, though, we also have some Carla Olson on tape from when? That's from, that's from uh, the album Midnight Mission that came out in, in 84 mm -hmm. on uh, Gold Mountain A&M. Uh -huh. And Barry and I wrote the title track, and uh, we uh, have written a few more since then, but I well, think this one's a pretty, pretty good representation of uh, how we felt at the time. Well, this is a little blast from the past. Let's uh, take a look at a couple minutes of... Uh, Midnight Mission, Carl Olson, 1984, huh? Okay. Time flies. There are faces of men who have lost in romance. There are others who never even had a chance. Old faces with not many years. Broken souls to tied for tears. No one here except the midnight mission Thank God there's someone who cares Oh, won't you light them up down at the midnight mission Downtown no one can see I said no light them up down at the midnight mission Thank God for humanity Jim, professional men, till something made him never wanna work again. Down on the corner, there's half a man lost his legs in some foreign land, and Betty never had nothing anyway. Thank God for you. 
Unbelievable. That, that it was, was just like yesterday, wasn't it? <laughs> brings back plenty of memories. That was your first. Uh, that was yesterday, wasn't it? Uh, that's your first uh, pairing musically, you and Barry. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so Barry actually produced uh, that album. Neato. Yeah. So now, what were we just saying? Another another great Barry song is a thing called um, "What I've Got to Use My Imagination." Is Gladys Knight. Gladys Knight and the Pips. Yeah. Number one hit. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh God! Um, actually, the song Martha Reeves recorded that. Oh really? And uh, oh, was this during the day? No, that was Martha after Reeves Martha was on Motown, though. After Martha was on Motown, yeah. she recorded. Richard Perry produced that. Actually, the, that was album. the yeah. first version was hers. Huh. And I had actually written the song for Albert King, huh. and uh, who uh, I actually took it to Memphis, huh. and at that time it was run by uh, Isaac Hayes and. Those people were running stacks. Uh -huh. It was very hard to get in, and finally got in and tried to persuade them that this was a great song, and to rec I wanted Albert to have a hit on it, and they just didn't hear it. Hmm. So later, later on, and it took about a year for that song to get recorded. Neil Bogart picked up on it, and uh, and Richard Perry and wow. Martha recorded, and Gladys did it. Speaking of Albert, uh, you're misidentified as Albert Cooper in uh, one. What, in, in, uh, it's amazing how this guy keeps flowing through. Anthony, uh, what's his name? Anthony Scudetto's book on Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. That's only yeah. 1970 or so, but it's a frame of you at Newport, and it's his Al Cooper. I didn't ever want to tell you, Barry. Oh, I don't want to okay. break your heart. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> so, uh, so Cooper was not there at all. Oh yeah. He was there, we but the it just wasn't him in the picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> he was in the picture, but there were two keyboard players. And I forget which one was on piano, which one was on organ. It, it so were you there when people booed? Oh yeah. You were there when, and a few not, for, not for you, Barry. A I mean, few they people were cheered. A few people realized yeah. it was, uh, you know, a big thing that was happening. We old timers remember that when Bob Dylan went electric, he did half a folk set at the beginning and then came back after the intermission with the rock stuff and the purest booed. Yes. So you were there to receive those booze. Yes. Uh, but it didn't dissuade <laughs> you, because here you are now. <laughs> <laughs> Still playing. <laughs> and where are those purists? Yeah, going? right. Where are those guys, anyways? Uh -huh. uh, so I wonder if anybody would admit. They're working for the record labels yeah, now, Todd. I was one of the guys who booed <laughs> Bob Dylan at Newport, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> you never hear those people <laughs> popping up. Well, uh, really. Kyla, back to Austin, you said that uh, you were in a, a t more or less top 40 band, uh, Stones band, 60s band, then formed the Tex Tones, and Kathy Valentine, who later joined the Go-Go's, was with you. Right. So then how and why did you guys come to L.A.? You couldn't play original material in Austin at that uh, point in time unless you were playing country or R&B. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if you were doing that, you were playing for beer money, you know, or free pizza or some nachos or something. That's what it's they pay you. not much different than here. That's true. It's <laughs> different than here yeah, now, exactly. Yeah, right. That's true. Uh, so yeah. the Textones played around L.A. for about five years, right? No, lo longer than that, Art. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I saw you out at Sasha's, I know. Uh, we, uh, we officially disbanded last year, so it would have been nine, and a, nine ten years. And how so did there you is no Textones now? Not at this point, no. Now, how did you acquire Phil Seymour on drums back in when, 84? or something. That was in, uh, actually, uh, he cut the original demos for the album Midnight Mission and became part of the band after that. It just was one of those things. He was uh, had just gotten out of a deal with uh, Bogart, with uh, uh, Neil Bogart's label, um, Boardwalk. Boardwalk, yeah. And he had a, a top 20 hit and, you know, then the second album, Sophomore, you know, Crisis and the whole thing and basically was without a deal and I needed a drummer. And he's a great drummer, and he sings great, so I needed somebody that could sing, too, that could sing backgrounds. And uh, so he just became part of the band, and we stayed together for uh, quite a few years. And then he left the band. I got another drummer from Tulsa, so, you know, those Okies, they stay in the band with me. You know, he's still playing drums for me now, so, you know, yeah, Rick Himmer is playing with me. And I still have all the Textones in the band, it's just the Textones aren't called the Textones anymore. Oh, I see. Yeah. Is that in hopes of fooling somebody into thinking? No, that? actually, my bass player moved back to England, uh, Joe Reed, and, yeah. and uh, I got another bass player from Texas. I used to play in a band with Kathy Valentine with. His name's Jesse Sublett, famous, sure. uh, famous author. author. Exactly. Rock author Critic, Murders. Rock Critic Mur Murders. Tough <laughs> baby. Exactly. And he's been playing bass with me now for a couple of years, and, uh, but the rest of the Texans, Tom Morgan, George Callan, still the same. So. 
So, so we can't fool anybody, Todd. Yeah, why why did you change the name? <laughs> it just was not the same music anymore. I mean, yeah. I was starting to go into an R&B thing, which I've always wanted to do. And Jesse's a real good R&B bass player, so we just sort of decided at this point it was it was time to bag it. So uh, he nobody the, got it anyway. So, he wrote this book. You know. Jesse wrote this book called "The Rock Critic Murders," in hopes, I think, that every musician in the country would buy one. <laughs> and then it turns out that rock critics being murdered has very, 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 very little to do with anything. I mean, it's a good book. It's mm -hmm. an interesting book and about the music business, but doesn't really live up to its title. Yeah, it's a it's a series. It's going to be you know really? the Martin okay. Fender series. Yeah, um, Martin Fender, detective. <laughs> Martin Fender, I get <laughs> the level of subtlety. Well, guitars, on, but guitar makers yeah, is what you're saying. Yeah. Right? Uh, Musicians, uh, funny guys. So, uh, <laughs> being as how you uh, had a record, we're just about over, by the way. So, good night, and I'll keep talking. Uh, uh, you had a record out in Sweden last year. So, right. have you been touring in Scandinavia at all? Not this past year. I've been over a couple of three times, and hope to go again uh, in February or March. At 91. Me. I'm going to make a new album with Gene Clark, so I'm going to be going over for that. Gene Clark, Gene you just want to ask you the guy who isn't Quick. a bird anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, She loves to watch. She comes out make herself known. She loves to watch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it really turns her on. She loves to watch. Well, it's a more than fun. Just want to meet her.